Aloha and welcome to the energy flow through the ecosystems video. In this video we will name the different ways organisms get their energy, we'll identify the different roles in a food chain or a food web, and then finally we'll describe an ecosystem using an energy pyramid. So one of the big questions for living things is how do you get your energy to live? Well we have two basic ways that we can do this. The first is you can be an autotroph. And an autotroph is called that because it's able to make its own food or get its own energy. And a lot of these are going to be phototrophs, which means they use light to get this energy and convert it. So we're talking about autotrophs. Mainly what we're going to talk about is like the grass you see here, our, our plants. Our plants are phototrophs. They take the energy in sunlight and they convert that into chemical energy that the cells can then use later on for the processes of living. Now, if you're not an autotroph, that would mean you are a heterotroph. And an heterotroph gets its energy from the food that it eats. And we and the cow that you see down here are what we call chemotrophs because we get our energy from chemicals. And primarily the energy that we get is going to come from glucose or the sugars, which the phototrophs make from the sunlight in the process of photosynthesis. Okay, what you see here are a couple examples of food chains. And what a food chain shows us is the flow of energy through an ecosystem. So we have to take the energy that's out there in the non-living part of the ecosystem and then find a way to convert it so it is usable for the rest of the organisms there. And a food chain shows us this flow of energy. Most food chains are going to start here with a producer, and for most of them we'll use a plant. That plant's going to take the energy from the sun and convert it into chemical energy in the form of sugar. Now, from those producers, we get into the nature of a consumer. And a consumer consumes something to get its energy and its resources, so it has to eat. In here, on our terrestrial our land example, we have a primary consumer of a cricket, which is going to eat the grass. And then we move up to a secondary consumer, which is the frog, which will then eat the grasshopper. And then we have our tertiary consumer up here, which is our bird of prey, which is going to feed on the frogs. Now we can have the same type of situation in an aquatic environment where we have our seaweed or our water plants which are going to be fed upon by a small fish which is going to be our primary consumer and those small fish in turn are eaten by larger fish and that larger fish is going to be eaten by a pelican or a larger bird which would be our tertiary consumer. So when we're talking about these food chains we're always going to start off with some kind of a producer that's going to put the energy into the ecosystem so in a usable format for the animals to use and then those producers are going to be eaten by consumers and we'll have primary secondary tertiary quaternary depending on how far away it is from the producer now nature doesn't work in straight lines very often so the food chains are nice because it gives us a small picture that we can trace but in reality, most of what we're going to see is going to take in the place of what we call and what we see here is a food web. And our food web is going to take our food chain. So if we remember our last food chain, we had our producer here, our primary consumer, secondary and tertiary. So this was our food chain. Now that's not the only way that energy is going to flow. If we look at our hawk here, it's going to eat frogs, but it'll also eat other things. So we can add to it that it'll eat mice and it'll eat birds. And that leads us to, well, what do the mice eat? And in the case here, our mice are eating this plants with seeds, but if we know mice, we know that they'll also eat an insect if they can get it. They'll also eat a worm if they can find it. So we can start seeing some different things here. We have our birds, and our birds will eat the insects as well, and they'll eat the plants, and they can eat the worms. And then, what do worms eat? Worms are gonna eat the bacteria in the soil, and what's that bacteria is going to feed on dead organisms and those dead organisms are going to be all of these ones that weren't eaten or weren't fully digested. So you can see how it gets a lot more complex and when we put all these food chains together we can create what we call a food web and that's what you see here. Now the last visual representation we'll show of energy flowing through an ecosystem is what we call an energy pyramid and you see an example of it here. Now we start with some kind of external energy source and we don't put it into the pyramid because normally these external sources are what we would call limitless. So the amount of energy in the sun is limitless for us. The plants can't use all of it. The sun's not going to run out of energy and when it does run out of energy we won't be around. So it's not like it's ever going to run out. It's a never ending supply. So it's a limitless supply. So that energy flowing in, we don't worry about, but we'll notice that that energy flowing in is going to happen at the lowest level here. 
So 100% of the energy that's fixed or taken from the sunlight is going to reside down in this level here where we have our producers. Now as we go up levels in the pyramid, you see they get smaller. And what happens is, is we see a reduction in the amount of energy there. So if we have 100% of energy in the plants, only 10% of that energy is going to move up to the next level. And the reason for that is plants have to perform their functions to live. So they have to grow, they have to do all of their cellular processes. So it takes 90% of the energy just for life. And that's just our rough estimate. So we always say that when we're looking at these levels, 90% of the energy that they acquire is used for living and then 10% is going to move forward. So if we look at our grasshopper here, it's going to take 90% of the energy that it consumes from eating the producers and send 10% on. So we see what's 10% of 10%. That's going to be 1% of energy moves on to the birds here. And they're going to use 90% of that energy and send up only 10%. So by the time we get to a tertiary consumer, it's getting one-tenth of one percent of the energy that was created, not necessarily created, but fixed by the plants. So every time we take a step up, we lose 90% for living. Only 10% is going to move up from level to level. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, they'll go into a, what we covered in a lot more depth in the lessons. So good luck with the lessons, and as always, we'll see you in the next video. Aloha and welcome to the cycling of chemicals in an ecosystem video. The goals for today's video are to discuss the different way chemicals cycle through an ecosystem, we'll relate chemical cycling to geological processes, and then we'll trace the cycles of carbon, nitrogen, and water. Okay, so the first cycle we're going to take a look at is the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle shows us the pathway that carbon takes through an ecosystem. So it's going to do this with two different processes, and we've talked about these processes before. The first process that we're going to mention is going to be photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis happens in plants primarily. These are our producers and they're going to take in this water and they'll take in carbon dioxide and using the energy of the sun, they're able to convert those into sugar and into oxygen. And we can see the carbon here in the CO2 is now over here in the sugar. So we're seeing that flow of carbon. Now the second process is cellular respiration. And then cellular respiration is where we take these sugars and we break them apart with oxygen to get energy and we have byproducts of water and carbon dioxide. So once again we can see that we had our carbon here and our carbon is going to go back here. So we can see this pathway of carbon that we go from carbon and the carbon dioxide here to the carbon and sugars and then when we break those sugars apart it goes back to that carbon dioxide and that's why we call it a carbon cycle because it's cyclical in nature it goes around and around and is reused and reused and reused next up is the nitrogen cycle and the nitrogen cycle is kind of important we use nitrogen to build proteins it's in our amino acids and things of that nature so without it we wouldn't be able to grow now the problem is, is there's a lot of nitrogen gas in the air, but we can't use that. Plants can't use that. Animals can't use that. It's just this bank of nitrogen that we can't use. So instead, what we have is we have some bacteria. And the bacteria that's in the soil is going to break it down. It's going to form a couple different things. And we're going to form these nitrates. And when we form these nitrates, then the plants can use the nitrates and they'll use that to make their amino acids and then when we eat the plants or an animal eats the plants that's how we move that nitrogen on up the cycle so what happens when we die well then we become something for the decomposers which are going to break it down into ammonia and so on and so forth and you can start seeing the cyclical nature okay so there's a lot of nitrogen but we can't use much of it we actually need this bacteria and these decomposers to make this process work Okay, let's take a look at the water cycle real quick. Now our water cycle is unique because our water cycle is going to include both living things, so things from the biosphere, and non-living things. Okay, and these non-living things or non-living processes are going to be 
in the ecosystem, but it could be the geosphere, it can be weather patterns, it can be all those things non-living that are going to factor into this. So this cycle is going to be a little bit different from the other two that we talked about. So as we go through, we will kind of show you what's the non-living ones. Now, we can do this real simple. We can go through and we can say oceans are where we find our storage of water. And through the process of evaporation, the water comes out until it condenses into clouds. And when the clouds get full, they precipitate down. And we have this precipitation come to groundwater flow and ultimately back to the oceans. And we go there and there's no living things whatsoever in there. So we have to have a way to include a little bit of the living things in the water cycle. So when we drink, what we have is we can have what we call evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is going to be when we exhale out. If you've ever exhaled on like a mirror or something like that and it gets kind of cloudy, the reason being is our lungs are moist. And every time we exhale, we release a little bit of water that way. So we'll drink the water in and then just through breathing, we're letting that water come out and that water that comes out will evaporate up and join the cycle that way. We can also talk about other ways that we can add to the system and we take away from drinking that water. But you can see how this biological component fits into this geologic process of the water cycle. And that's kind of important to know that that happens. Okay, so let's quickly review the three cycles that we talked about. We'll start with the carbon cycle here. And the carbon cycle is where photosynthesis changes this carbon dioxide into organic molecules and those organic molecules are going to be sugars. Now, these sugars pass through the food chain from one organism to the other, and once they get into an organism, it's cellular respiration that will break it down to get its energy. And in that process of cellular respiration, our byproduct is going to be carbon dioxide, which is then goes back up to here, and we see this whole cycle repeating itself. Now, the next cycle is the nitrogen cycle. And in the nitrogen cycle, we have bacteria in the soil that takes in nitrogen gas, and we have decomposers that are going to break it down to ammonium. And then other bacteria take this ammonium and turn it into nitrates. And nitrates are what plants can use to build these amino acids and nucleotides. Then these amino acids and nucleotides are going to pass up through the food chain, and then once the organism dies, decomposers come, and they're going to return this, and we see this whole process going through again. Okay, so even though there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, we can't make use of it. Most animals can't. We have to rely on this bacteria to actually make it usable for us. Okay, and finally we have the water cycle. And the water cycle is where we saw it as being more geologic. So solar energy warms up bodies of water causing evaporation. The evaporation goes up where it's cooler and we get our condensation. From the condensation, we get our precipitation, it runs down, and this whole process continues, but we don't see a lot of life in there. But remember, we were talking about evapotranspiration. So when we exhale, we exhale out water. Plants have water that flows from the roots all the way up through the leaves, and they're releasing out a lot of water that way as well. So there are living things and steps in the water cycle where we can see that. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, the lessons are going to go into this in a lot more detail, so you'll get to learn a little bit more about it. And also, as always, good luck on the lessons, and we will see you in the next video. Aloha and welcome to the biomes video. In this video, we'll discuss how solar energy and weather influence the ecosystem. We'll give some examples of land biomes, and we'll identify some different aquatic biomes. Okay, when we're talking about biomes, we have to compare and contrast and talk about weather and climate. Weather is an instantaneous snapshot of what's going on outside. Climate is when we look at it over the long time. So there's a time component into climate that we want to see. Now, what causes changes in the weather or what causes the weather? Well, it would be uneven heating of the Earth's surface. So because we're tilted like this, we get a little bit less sunlight at the poles than we do down at the tropics. And we'll notice some variations there. And this uneven heating makes some pockets of air warmer than others, and that's what causes weather. But weather is instantaneous. It's how is it today? How is it right now? Climates, when we factor in this time component and put it this way. 
And one of the things I want to mention is we hear an awful lot about climate change and things like that and how we're affecting the climate of the earth. The reason for that is is not because we have control over the weather and not because we have control over the climate, but some of the pollutants that we're releasing, and namely carbon dioxide, is changing the atmospheric chemistry, and that's causing a variation in climate. So it's actually going to get a little bit warmer in some places, which might actually make it colder in others. Okay, so when we talk about terrestrial biomes, terrestrial means land, so these are the different places in land to live on. And remember that biomes are going to be weather over long periods of time give us our climate, so these biomes are going to be these vast areas that share the same kind of climate conditions. Now, the first one we'll start off at the equator is our tropical forest, and you'll hear these as a tropical rainforest. These are going to be high temperatures, lots of moisture often, and lots of species of plants and organisms, lots of biodiversity in the rainforests, and you hear about that kind of stuff. Coming out from there, what we have is the savanna, and savanna are going to be large areas of land with grasses. Okay, so we're going to see large grazing animals, and that was we see that a lot like in Africa where you have the African savanna and you have the wildebeest migrations and things of that nature. When you get down to low rainfall, now we're talking about a desert, and that's where the organisms are adapted to save water. Most deserts tend to be warm, but we do have some cold deserts as well, and it's just primarily determined by the amount of rainfall that they get. We also have a chaparral, and a chaparral is kind of like if we mixed these two together, kind of, sort of, is what we'd end up with. You get really rainy winters, really dry summer, and it's not a grassland, it's more of a shrubland, and we'll see where those are located as well. We're moving out away from the equator, we get to our temperate grasslands, and that's going to have large areas of grass, highly fertile soil, and that's like the American Midwest, and we'll show you that on a map. And then we also have our temperate deciduous forests, and our deciduous forests are where we have our hot summers, cold winters, lots of rain. Deciduous trees are those that shed their leaves, mammals tend to hibernate. So back east we see a lot of this where we have a nice hardwood forest that's there in the summertime and in the winter time it loses its leaves and the animals tend to hibernate away going a little further away we get to our coniferous forests and that's where we have our cone bearing trees we have more snow it generally is a little bit cooler and those pine like needles the leaves they have there is going to allow them to adapt to that change in temperature and then ultimately we get to the tundra, and the tundra is going to be cold, but it's also going to be dry. We don't have very many trees, and we have a lot of what they call permafrost, and permafrost is where the ground is frozen all the time. So only certain organisms can get roots down into that and extract out water from that. So it's an interesting biome to look at. So these are our terrestrial biomes. In the next couple of slides, what we're going to do is just kind of flip through and show you where they are in a representative picture of them. So let's go take a look at some of these. First up, going back down to the tropics, we're going to see our tropical forests, okay? And these can be our rainforests. And what we'll notice is they're going to be in the tropics here. You'll see it here. And most of these areas, they're going to get a lot of rainfall. And that's what keeps them lush and green, and you can see it here. The interesting thing about tropical forests is they tend to be layered. So you'll have some ground cover here. You'll have some intermediate plants that will give you another layer here. You'll have another, the normal tree layer here. And then you have some of these super plants that go super tall and form another layer. So in the rainforests, you have these multiple layers here. And you can see where you have more areas for biodiversity. Next up are the savannas. And you can see the savannas here tend to be in the tropics as well. Okay, and it's going to be a large kind of a grassland, lots of migrating animals, and pronounced wet and dry seasons. So those are our savannas. Continuing our little exploration, we get to our deserts. And you're familiar, we live one here in Las Vegas. But we'll also see the deserts are going to be here. And what marks the deserts is going to be this lack of rainfall. So even if we're high up in the Andes Mountains here, the reason that it's a desert is this lack of water. And because of that, the plant life is going to be sparse. It's going to be like spread out a little bit. Those plants that are there have the ability to retain and store water longer so they're able to live there. The next one are the chaparrales. 
and the chaparrales we'll see like on the California coast here. And that's kind of like a shrubland. So they get a little bit more water than a grassland would, but still it's kind of a harsh place to live. We see a lot of it here in Southern Europe, Northern Africa will have a little bit as well. And that's where you'll go out and see a lot of shrubs. So intermediately sized plants, not big tall trees, but not the grasses either. Moving on a little further, we get to our temperate grasslands, and we'll see those, like I said, in the Midwest of America here. We also see it down here in Argentina. We'll see it around in Australia, and then over here we see it in, Europe, in Asia as well. And the grasslands are very fertile regions. These are where you have a lot of fertile soil because the grass grows, it dies, it breaks down, it returns the nutrients to the soil, and it just makes this really good soil for us. And this is where we could actually produce the food that we would need for the species to feed the entire world. We could do that just using the grasslands. We also have the temperate deciduous forests, and you'll notice it's back like on the eastern half of the United States. We'll see it there, primarily through Europe here, and then we also see it here on the east coast of Asia. And here we have our deciduous trees. Those are going to be green in the summertime, and then it's a colder winter time, and the plants will lose their leaves. They drop their leaves, the animals hibernate, so it's kind of where we see the changing of colors and things of that nature. All right, keeping moving, we get to the taiga or the coniferous forests. And notice those are going to be a little bit closer to the poles. Okay, and it'll also be in a little bit higher elevations is where we start seeing the pine trees. And that's what we're talking about, these being here. And then ultimately we get up to the tundra. And you'll see the tundra here, and that's a region where we have permafrost. So the ground is permanently frozen, not a lot of plant life there. You can see it's very sparsely populated. You might get some grasses growing in the warmer seasons, but it never really truly gets warm enough to have an extended growing season to allow trees and shrubs and things of that nature to grow. Okay, so the last area that we wanna talk about in this video is gonna be the aquatic biomes. The ocean is going to be broken into two different regions when we're talking about depth, but then there's also different regions when we're talking about the bottom. When we're talking about depth, we have the photic zone, and the photic zone goes down to about 200 meters, and that's about how deep that sunlight goes down. So you can actually have photosynthesis, you can actually see, um, there's light there that you can see what's going on. Below that is the aphotic zone where it's so deep that sunlight can't penetrate through that much water. So that's where it gets to be dark and you don't have any photosynthesis and you have some really weird creatures and things living down there because of the pressure. So we can set it up that way. Now we can also divide the ocean by what's the bottom like. So we have our open ocean where it's so deep. Okay, so you won't get down to the abyssal plain. It's so deep that it's just basically an open ocean community. There's not like there's a bottom. It's so deep it doesn't come into play. We can have a benthic zone here where it's going to be kind of deep. Generally going down the continental shelf is where we get our benthic zone here. We'll have our coastal zone, which is going to be over the continental shelf. And then ultimately we have the intertidal, which is the area between low tide and high tide. and maybe extends out a little bit beyond that but that's what we're talking about. So we can define it by where the bottom is and how deep the water is, but also by how much light it gets or if it gets light at all. Um, there's also freshwater aquatic biomes. We have rivers, lakes, streams, estuaries, things of that nature. The lessons will go into those a little bit more in detail for you. So have fun with that. Um, good luck with the lessons. And as always, we'll see you in the next video.